namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangachami Dhammang Saranangachami Sanghang Saranangachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranangachami Dutiyampi dhammang saranangachami Dutiyampi sanggang saranangachami Tatiyampi buddhang saranangachami Tatiyampi dhammang saranangachami Tatiyampi sanggang saranangachami So, welcome friends. Uh, to this uh, Wednesday night Sutta class. And uh, tonight Sutta we're going to go over uh, the, is the shorter discourse, uh, shorter discourse on uh, shunyata or voidness. Uh, and if we have time, maybe the uh, greater discourse on voidness. Now, uh, this term voidness, of course, you know, you hear, I guess, they talk about the outer space as being like the void or, uh, you know, it's used in some context of, uh, you know, physical uh, uh, entity, especially in a Western, uh, let's say, scientific uh, kind of, uh, you know, when, when scientists or ordinary people talk about it. But of course, uh, you might be familiar with in the Majjhimika uh, philosophy, uh, expounded primarily by the uh, Tibetan Buddhists, amongst Buddhists anyway, uh, they talk about uh, uh, you know the the sunyata uh, and voidness. These are a kind of interchanged, uh, but I want to. These two discourses that we're going to go over tonight are the Buddha's way of explaining uh, voidness or sunyata from his point of view, from his enlightened point of view. And he talks about it in, in a, you know, is a, is a gradual uh, sort of attainment. There's many uh, levels of voidness. And voidness means that it's like emptiness. So if there was an empty room with no furniture or anything in it, you'd say this room is void of any uh, furniture. Uh, but uh, it might have some other things in it. Uh, anyway, so this uh, shorter discourse on voidness uh, the Buddha was living in, uh, in Savati and the Venerable Ananda came to see the Buddha. And he reminded the Buddha that when the Buddha was staying in some other place, the Buddha often uh, talked or, or he said, the Venerable Sir, I have heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. Ananda, I often abide in voidness. And so Ananda asked him, did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly, Venerable Sir? 
Did I attend to that correctly? Remember it, Venerable Sir? And the Buddha replied, certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly. You learned that correctly, attended to that correctly. Remember that correctly. And, and as then, so too now, I often abide in uh, voidness. So he talks about it uh, and he explains it. Just as this palace of Migawa's mother is void of elephants and cattle and people and all kinds of things, uh, the, oh, well, not people, it says, uh, uh, there's only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of bhikkhus. So you can imagine, you know, a couple hundred bhikkhus sitting around in a kind of big empty room and, uh, you know, no other noise is heard. Of course, those days they didn't have uh, cars <laughs> and all kind of other things making noise. But uh, so... He's saying it's void of everything except the sangha of, of bhikkhus. And then he goes on to, to say, to enlarge that, to say the forest. So if he's sitting in the forest, he said this forest is also empty of villages. It's empty of cows and various things. And so the mind is gradually going more into the, what he calls the descent into voidness like descending in the voidness. You don't just necessarily jump there immediately, although if somebody is very highly developed, they might be able to. But uh, so let's say you go to the forest, or let's say you even go to your own house. You go in your room and you turn off all the distractions and then you, you, know, you start to meditate and uh, the mind gets uh, calm but you still might hear the ticking of a clock or you might hear a, you know, a cat meowing for, you know, or, or whatever, but you know, the, the mind is void of everything except uh, those few kind of uh, uh, disturbances. So there is present only this amount of disturbance, uh, namely on that perception of what is immediately around you. And he understands this field of perception uh, that there is only this non-voidness, namely the, the mind that's uh, focused in that uh, state of calmness and maybe what is uh, immediately going around. So we have this body with six senses. The senses are always open. And the senses receive sense stimulations like radar. And so when you're sitting deep in meditation, uh, you know, you might not have a lot of other disturbances, but just whatever might happen to be coming through the senses, uh, that is kind of, you know, you know, there's some kind of sounds in the background, but the mind is not, uh, going out to them and it's not interpreting them and thinking about them but there's just like uh you know say the white noise of crickets uh, going on in, in the background uh, but there's everything else is very uh, silent the mind is silent and other gross uh, disturbances are uh, silent so that is a kind of uh, elementary or beginning levels of the descent into voidness and then the Buddha says, not attending to the perception of forest. So the mind, this means he's getting deeper into meditation now. So he leaves just kind of basic awareness and let's say maybe even access concentration and so on. And he pays attention to the earth element. Uh, And his mind, uh, you know, enters into that earth element uh, me meditation or the jhana. So he attains the first jhana, and then that has five jhana factors: the piti sukha, ekagata, 
and uh, Vitaka and Vichara. Then the second jhana, let go of Vitaka and Vichara, applied and sustained thought, so the mind gets quieter. But it still has piti and sukha, uh, joy and, and happiness. So he lets go of that, he enters the third jhana. So he becomes void of piti, becomes void of Vitaka and Vichara. But it still has that subtle disturbance of, of sukha. Uh, and then he goes into the fourth jhana, which has purified mindfulness and equanimity, but it's still connected to the body. Uh, and so he goes through each of those jhanas doing the same thing. Ah, and this jhana is void of the disturbances in the previous one. So that is also the, the descent uh, uh, a viable uh, descent into voidness. And then after going through the jhanas, he goes on to the, uh, <clears throat> he lets go of even the casina, whatever the earth casina he might have been cultivating. And he abandons that earth casina and then pays attention to the perception of infinite space. So now he's, he's going into the formless jhanas where there wouldn't be any uh, sensory contact really. Uh, and it becomes void of even uh, the joy and happiness of the jhanas or other sensory stimulation. And uh, there's only the non-voidness of infinite space. So he says, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure, descent into voidness. And then he goes through the immaterial jhanas. He, he lets go of the infinite space and keep the mind gets more and more refined and he enters into the infinite consciousness and then into nothingness and then into the neither perception nor non-perception. So with each of these, he's going deeper and deeper into the voidness that means means it's becoming, uh, has less and less uh, possible disturbances, even of what infinite spice might have brought or what infinite consciousness or nothingness might have brought. He keeps on, uh, gets on refining uh, that. And then he goes on to the uh, the <clears throat> the base of uh, neither perception nor non-perception, and he understands that this is void of all the previous types of perceptions. And then he lets go of even the, the state of neither perception nor non-perception. And his mind enters into the signless concentration of mind. And the signless concentration of mind is usually said to be the actual experience of the arhant in the fruition attainment of the arhantship. Uh, and it would be uh, the signless element, the same, because there's no sign, so it would be uh, the, the more pure voidness. <clears throat> and, and he says, there is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. And this too is a genuine, undistorted, pure descent into uh, voidness. And then he doesn't even get attached to that. He says, this signless concentration of mind is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is subject to cessation. 
And when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, liberated from the taint of being, liberated from the taint of ignorance. And when it is liberated, there comes a knowledge it is liberated. And he understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There's more no, there's no more coming to any state of being. And so he, he understands whatever disturbances might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire and hatred and delusion. Those are not present in that state. And thus he, he tells Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness, supreme and unsurpassed. So in other words, the state of the arahant uh, and the fruition attainment, that means when an arahant sits down to meditate, his mind enters into the deathless element. And it's, it's similar to that state of uh, Nibbana after the Arhant uh, dies, although the Arhant is not dead, but uh, you know it's it's like it's you know it's none of the senses anything is working, but it still has the life faculty. And so at the end he says, Ananda, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have entered upon and abided in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness all entered upon and abided in the same pure, unsurpassed voidness. And whatever recluses are Brahmins in the future, uh, they will also uh, abide in the same unsurpassed uh, voidness. So he tells Ananda, you should train yourself. We will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed uh, voidness. And with that, the Ananda was uh, pleased with what the, the Buddha had said. So this voidness that the Buddha is talking about is not a, phys, a philosophical type of, uh, uh, you know, you know, theory, or it's not a philosophical uh, Treatise, like let's say in the uh, Madhyamika philosophy, you know, they uh, you know, treat the doctrine of uh, sunyata sort of in that uh, way, uh, but uh, they, they don't tell you how to get there. You know, they say it's uh, you know, there's no four noble truths, there's no eightfold path, there's no enlightenment or non enlightenment, and they make this philosophical type of uh, uh, you know, statement about uh, the, the sunyata. But uh, the Buddha was talking about purely in terms of uh, the mind and uh, getting the mind, weaning the mind from, uh, you know, greater and greater types of uh, disturbances. So even when you sit to meditate, you could say when you go to sit to meditate, you know, you're descending into voidness. So the fact that, okay, you've come from outside, you've come from shopping, you've come from running around at work. You know, you go into your family room, maybe your children and, or the dog and cat are there, you know, and so you go into your room, so you're descending more into voidness. That means less and less kind of distractions. And then you sit down to meditate. You know, you turn off your computer and your beepers and your uh, telephones. And then, you know, focus in on your uh, breathing. And so you're descending more gradually into that state of voidness where there's less and less disturbance. Until, of course, you start meditating and then the hindrances become your uh, disturbances. Uh, but in most of this sutta, the Buddha was talking about, you know, after one has gotten overcome the hindrances and has attained the, the state of, let's say, at least the first jhana uh, would be that, uh, that first kind of 
kind of real descent into voidness and then going through all those states as we already mentioned. Now, uh, this next sutta, the Maha Sunyata Sutta, is uh, interesting. I mean, it, it covers the same material basically, but it's a, it's a rebuke. It's kind of the Buddha was addressing Ananda and how the, Ananda got busy doing lots of things. And even Ananda could not enter into these deep states of uh, meditation and uh, voidness. And so this, uh, the Mahasunyata Sutta, uh, uh, in Kapilavastu, the, the, the Buddha went to a certain uh, person's uh, dwelling, this Sakya, this uh, Sakyan, a lay person, he had a big uh, property, I guess. And uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of sitting places spread out. And, uh, and uh, Venerable Ananda was there and he asked Ananda, are many, are, are many monks living here? Because he saw a lot of sitting places. And he said, uh, The, the Ananda told the Buddha that no, there are a lot of visiting monks have come and now is the time for making robes. So they were making some noise because they, they were kind of socializing a bit, you know, and uh, just talking while they were uh, sewing their robes, I guess. And the Buddha heard all that and, uh, and he knew Ananda was oftentimes doing that. He liked to socialize with people. He liked to talk with people and uh, so on. So he was kind of uh, rebuking him. And so he, uh, Ananda tells him, many bhikkhus are living here, Bhante. This is our time for making robes, Venerable Sir. And then the Buddha admonishes Ananda. A monk does not shine by delighting in company, by delighting in company, by devoting himself uh, to company, by delighting in society, by rejoicing in society. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a monk who delights in company and society uh, will ever obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. But it can be expected that when a bhikkhu lives alone, withdrawn from society, he will obtain at will without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. And so uh, the Buddha basically is admonishing uh, Ananda that he, you know, shouldn't be uh, taking joy and uh, having all these visiting monks come because he knew it was Ananda's habit. And that's why Ananda at that time, even though he, he lived with the Buddha so many years, even all of his life until the Buddha died, Ananda had not, he had only attained the state of a Sotapanna because of that busyness. Whereas so many hundreds and thousands of other monks and people, even lay people, had attained states more than uh, Venerable Ananda, who was the Buddha's right hand attendant. So then the Buddha tells him, I do not see even a single kind of form, Ananda, from the change and alteration of which there would not arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who lusts for it and takes delight in it. And that refers to even other, the forms of other people or uh, other material forms. And then he, he tells Ananda, there is this abiding discovered by the Tathagata to enter and abide in voidness internally 
by giving no attention to all signs. If while the Buddha is at, uh, abiding in this way, he is visited by bhikkhus and bhikkhunis uh, or kings and ministers, he doesn't delight in their visits. And it says he invariably talks to them in a way concerned with dismissing them. So, you know, if he's imbibing in that uh, deep meditation, if people come, you know, some, you know, out of politeness, he may talk, but his talk will be uh, with the purpose of, uh, you know, the, so these people would go away soon. So whatever that uh, means. So he tells Ananda, if a bhikkhu should wish, may I enter upon and abide in voidness internally. He should steady his mind, internally quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate. And basically that means uh, the, uh, the, the five aggregates, he, he, he uh, you know, tunes into those and then he also attains the, the jhanas based on that, uh, like uh, practicing the, the, the enlightenment factors by developing the enlightenment factors. He's still uh, being aware of the internal aggregates that are arising in him, sensations and, and so on. But he's, he developed it to that extent where you know, he attains uh, you know, the equivalent of the vipassana jhana. So uh, that's avoiding, abiding in the voidness internally by giving no attention to other signs that are uh, coming through the senses. And it says from that uh, uh, voidness, internal voidness, he again attains the, all the jhanas. And then he gives attention to voidness internally. And the mind does not go into it right away. And he gives attention to voidness externally and internally and externally. That means he contemplates external things like all, you know, certain people, they're also void of self and they're impermanent and a void of self and objects are void of self. So that's contemplating voidness externally. Uh, and by doing all that, he uh, again, like in the previous sutta, he develops uh, insight and he you know, attains enlightenment. But he also reflects in that state, he can reflect about on the greed, hatred, and delusion. The mind is free from greed, hatred, and delusion. While walking, he says, may no evil unwholesome states uh, beset me. And whatever he is doing, whether standing, walking, sitting, laying down, he is uh, cultivating either the insight into everything is empty, uh, so that's a voidness uh, achieved through insight, and then the avoidness achieved through attaining uh, the jhanas, and you, uh, attaining jhanas through the, the practice of, of in, insight. And so I'm not going to go through uh, all of that, but he, you know, he basically he contemplates, uh, you know, much of the the dhamma and what a hindrance the the sensual pleasures are and so on. And, and he abides contemplating the rise and fall of those five aggregates of clinging. The conceit I am based on these five aggregates is abandoned in him. When that is so, the monk understands the conceit I am based on these aggregates 
is abandoned in me. In that way, he has full awareness of that. These states are entirely wholesome and have a wholesome outcome. They are noble, super mundane, and inaccessible to Mara. So that's the understanding that the person has who cultivates you know, the mind in this way. And then the Buddha asks, what do you think, Ananda? What good does a disciple see that he should seek the teacher's company, even if he is told to go away? I'm not going to explain all that, but basically he says a person shouldn't go to a teacher just to hear discourses and, and to hear various things, but only for when the teacher gives him a talk that leads to complete disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. That is talk on wanting little, on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue, concentration, wisdom, deliverance, knowledge and vision of deliverance. For the sake of such a talk, a disciple should teach seek the teacher's company, even if he is told to go away. Uh, and then he also talks about even teachers undoing. You know, if a teacher uh, gets too many disciples and gets too friendly even with disciples, then that can uh, cause his mind to uh, incur more defilements and to lose that uh, concentration. And also the pupil, uh, the student's uh, understanding uh, or undoing comes about where he allows his mind to also get caught up in conversation and chit chat with all the visitors who come, oh, hi, yeah, who are you? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and when he sits down to meditate next time, he's saying, oh, who is that person? Where are they from? Oh, Columbus, Ohio. Oh, <laughs> you know, the mind starts wandering. So <laughs> the Buddha is, you know, admonishing the, the monks about, you know, if they're really serious about developing their meditation, they should uh, try to avoid that kind of chit chat. And then he says, and how do disciples behave towards the teacher? with friendliness, not with hostility. Here, Ananda, compassionate and seeking the, their welfare. The teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples want to hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. And they do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave toward the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility. And then at the very end, again, he addressing Ananda. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Because he rebuked Ananda. And so Ananda might have had some negative thoughts toward the Buddha because the Buddha, the Buddha was rebuking him for getting too socialized with uh, these visiting monks. So he's telling the, the Buddha not to have, get angry or hostile to the Buddha because the Buddha is trying to correct him. The Buddha is trying to, you know, teach him for his welfare about it. He knows that Ananda is only a Sotapanna after you know, 30, 40 years, you know, he's only a sotapanna. And he's listened to every single discourse of the Buddha and memorized them. But because of that busyness, he had not uh, attained the higher levels, you know, arahantship. When other monks come, listen to the Buddha, you know, go meditate, and within one week, they're attaining arahantship. So, So at the end, the Buddha tells him, I shall not treat you as the potter treats the raw, damp clay, repeatedly restraining you. 
I, I shall speak to you, Ananda, re repeatedly admonishing you. I shall speak to you. The sound core will stand the test, he says. And then the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's uh, words. <clears throat> so those are the, the two uh, the discourses on the uh, sunyata. And uh, so basically, again, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the Nibbana has uh, four, uh, the four types of Nibbana, not really types of Nibbana, but the way one uh, realizes Nibbana, what are called the four deliverances, the immeasurable, immeasurable deliverances, nothingness, voidness, and signless. So these are all names for Nibbana, which are the object of the fruition attainment. So when one's an Arahant, or even a Niroda Samapati, the cessation of feeling and perception is only attained by anagamis and arahants. And the nibbana is the object of that fruition uh, attainment. Because <clears throat> there's, there's two types of nibbana. One is nibbana with the, the aggregates remaining. And basically the Buddha was in uh, nibbana because that uh, the fruition of arahantship is, you know, it's a sort of a permanent state. And, but with the aggregates remaining, that means he still has sensory perceptions, but the mind is void and devoid of any attachment, greed, hatred, and delusion uh, toward them. And it's experiencing liberation and freedom from the ego. But it still has that subtle disturbance of because he's still experiencing things through the senses when he's awake. But when he goes into meditation and he attains the fruition, then he goes through all the jhanas where he can go directly into this fruition, which is similar to the experience of Nibbana, uh, you know, after the Arahant uh, passed away or those. Uh, the, the pure voidness. Okay, now uh, having, uh, you know, kind of gone over those uh, two suttas, let's see if there's any questions that have come up. Um, can you explain why the six senses are mentioned? What is their importance in the sutta? <clears throat> because our whole world revolves around the six senses. Basically, our experience of life from the moment you're born to the moment you die is nothing but contact through the senses, through the five physical senses and the mind, which is uh, interpreting those physical senses as well as remembering internal thoughts like memory or mental objects. So it's contacting the unconscious content of the mind is coming up, uh, emotions, thoughts, and so on, uh, visions. So that's all we are, the six senses. But people get attached to them and especially the five physical senses, their whole lives whirls around it. So first, you're, you've got to center your mind and detach the reactive mind from the six senses. That's the first descent into voidness. Like in most of my guided meditations and so I'm always encouraging people to 
you know, uh, you know, find that centeredness and groundedness in the present moment, in the breathing body. And when you reach that state of the first jhana of the breathing body, then, you know, there's just the remembering the vitak and vichara of just sitting and breathing. And it's experiencing things coming through the senses, but no, no other kind of thoughts or reactions, even pains, loud noises. They, uh, they'll be heard in a distant background, but they're not penetrating that, uh, that one-pointedness that we talk and we chara on the present moment. So, uh, and that's, that's really mastery, you know, uh, you can't live your life detached from the six senses. And so even an arhat goes through life has a senses, but there's been a, a kind of a disconnect. They're connected, but the mind is not connected in terms of attachment to them and going out to them. It can respond to them when necessary, but it doesn't suffer from them and it doesn't become obsessed or, uh, you know, really disturbed uh, by them. So <clears throat> that's why the importance about uh, in the sutta is that until you understand the six senses and their strong pull on you, you're never going to attain deeper states of concentration. Uh, and we develop insight through the senses. It's the impermanence of the senses, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking, observing their rise and fall that leads to the perception of impermanence and leads to the realization of the Four Noble Truths about suffering, the cause of suffering, and, uh, well, I mean, of the, uh, yeah, the, it realizes the Four Noble Truths as well as the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and no self. Uh, so there's no self within these six senses. So that's why they're important. Is first we have to understand the emptiness within the six senses, with the six senses still there, and then once you've let go of that and you've purified your reactions to those, then you can go into the deeper descent into voidness where you uh, transcend, temporarily transcend uh, the six senses. When you go into the formless jhanas, then you no longer are connected to the, to the five physical senses in the formless jhanas. And the mind is just in those... Uh, uh, formless jhana states. Uh, next question. This descent into voidness sounds much like sensory deprivation, which can be achieved by modern day machinery. What is the difference? Night and day difference. Night and day difference. Anybody can get peaceful when you remove the world around you. Like I've been into a sensory. <laughs> deprivation tank a long time ago just to see what it was like, you know. Uh, but so you physically remove all the distract. That's a false type of uh, experience because you can't live in that experience. So the Buddha never uh, would encourage that. I think I, I, I mentioned in one of my talks, maybe last week or something where, you know, monks were thinking all oh, this material world is evil and bad is better, you know, all these uh, seeing things. Maybe I gouge my eyes out. Maybe I better poke my eardrums to go deaf and go blind. And Buddhists call them foolish people for doing that. Because that is not the way that you overcome the senses by destroying them. So uh, <clears throat> uh, sensory deprivation, I wouldn't advise that. Uh, meditation is sensory deprivation. You know, this, this process that I've just been talking about and, you know, the process of samatha and vipassana is sensory deprivation. But naturally, not uh, going into these kind of, using these machines and other gadgets uh, to do that. Because then you won't be able to do it on your own. 
You're, you're going to carry your simper, sensory deprivation tank around with you on top of your car or, or any place else? No. We carry our sensory deprivation tank in our mind. That's our sensory deprivation tank. That means mindfulness and con concentration. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, these uh, all these mechanical ways of creating sensory deprivation. These are uh, just uh, temporary, and uh, and they're they're of no use really. Uh, not in terms of meditation. <clears throat> this descent into voidness. Oh, that was the question already. Okay, let me see. Wait a minute. What's happening here? Okay. Uh, from last week's suttas, I'm supposed to remember and recite all the suttas. But I already forgot most details. All I remember now from those two suttas is have to hear, remember, recite suttas. Greed, hatred, and delusion are be avoided. I forgot all the other details like where the Buddha taught. You know, you're going too far when I say memorize the suttas and memorize all the the details of you, you got to remember the important parts of the sutta. Uh, and like those five, uh, those five uh, things about, uh, you know, lending an ear, examining, uh, you know, visiting the teacher, examining, questioning, and, and things like that, the process, you got to memorize the process of meditation. What is, you know, the first foundation of mindfulness, the aggregates, how to deal with them, enlightenment factors. That's just what you have to remember. Not all the little details of uh, whose hermitage she was living in at this time or that time and, and so on. So, and you don't do it by just reading it or hearing it once. You got to read them over and over and over again. Again, with the with the important details, the, the, the things that kind of s stick in your mind, you know? So that's what we have to remember. On, I mean, Ananda was one of the very few monks who actually remembered word for word, verbatim, all the suttas that the Buddha, you know, gave over his lifetime. And even other Arhat monks, they wouldn't have remembered word for word, but they would have remembered the essentials because they would sit down and that's what they would discuss. They would discuss the five spiritual powers, the five spiritual faculties. They would, you know, discuss about the, you know, detachment and all these important Dhamma points. They would discuss. So, um, yeah, you know, don't try to remember the whole sutta. Even I don't have to memorize the whole suttas. Uh, but now, of course, in those days, they had to memorize it because they didn't have the internet, didn't they? And so nowadays, you know, that can be a help. At least you have that. Now you have it on a Kindle, right? You, in your back pocket, you can fit the whole tripitika in your back pocket on a Kindle, right? So, you know, it's a lot easier to, to just instantly look something up. Uh, but so anyway, it's remembering all those various lists that you remember. Those are the things that would be good to memorize. Because, you know, I've asked Sri Lankan people who are Buddhists, have been Buddhists uh, 30, 40 years, and even they have trouble repeating the H4 path without kind of thinking about it or, or you know, or telling anything a little deeper about it, you know. What's the difference between feeling and perception? Oh, duh. Mm -hmm. You know? So, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry if I <laughs> stuck, stepped on anybody's toes there, but I'm just saying that, uh, you know, uh, you have to, you know, those important parts of the suttas, uh, those are the ones we have to remember. Uh, 
The second sutta seemed to suggest that we must live a solitary life in order to achieve our Dharma goals. How does one practice in this way as a householder? Most of our lives resolves around relationship. Must we wait until we are reborn as monks? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you know, the, the Buddha did very clearly say that household life was dusty and, and uh, a hindrance. Now, that doesn't mean that householders didn't attain distinction. Now, you, we read in suttas or you, know, some, you have read in other suttas that uh, there were householders that would attain uh, the sotapana, even an, an Akhtapindika, the richest man in Savati who, uh, you know, uh, attained sotapana, and uh, even anagami and uh, uh, once returning in anagami. So it is possible, but, and it's depending on how you live the household life. If you live with somebody who also practices Dhamma, then you can practice renunciation, you know, you can, you know, after your cats, five cats die, stop buying a new one. And, uh, you know, gradually pare down uh, all the things that take your time, all the things that come up and say, oh, I can't go on a retreat this week because, you know, this came up and that came up and, you know, so that's the meaning. So you have to, practice that renunciation. Renunciation doesn't necessarily becoming a monk. It means renouncing the unnecessary things that you do out of boredom or just because you like them, but you know, they take your time away from meditation or you accumulate all these things, collections of stuff that then you have to protect and polish and all kinds of things. Uh, so anything that takes your mind is going to be a hindrance. So, that's why, uh, yes, I mean, but, you know, the practicing a lay person definitely, and, and I, again, as a lay person, you practice, maybe you won't attain even the stages of Sotapanna and higher, although you, some could, but it, you know, if you're going to be a lay person your whole life, then at least you die with all that Dhamma in your mind and then be able to pick it up, having memorized these things and are familiar with the suttas, you'll be able to get attracted to it much uh, sooner in the next life. So, you know, even if you don't uh, attain those, those stages and those highest states that he was talking about, even many monks that didn't attain those stages, even these days, uh, even myself, I don't profess to, I can't, uh, don't attain all these formless jhanas and so on. I don't necessarily try because I practice mostly insight meditation and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, developing the, you know, insights and I get a lot of joy out of that and uh, developing the, the kind of consciousness that comes with that. But, uh, so, anyway, the uh, you know, when you retire, a lot of people retire, they say, I'm going to meditate when I retire, but a lot of people, they retire, they get more busy when they retire. Uh, or by the time you retire, you may not have that strength to meditate enough. You know, and who knows, you might get sick in between that time or get some other kind of diseases. So that's why, you know, we have to apply ourselves and as best we can, even if we're living a, 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 you know, a lay life to practice the best we can. But, you know, learning how to, uh, you know, use the available free time to, in, you know, to meditate and to, to study, like so many people are doing now during this COVID pandemic, when they're out of work or something, then those who are attending all these sessions and other people, you know, they're, so, you know, they're, they're telling, you know, oh yeah, these things help me, you know, this constant reminding, you know, so that's the thing. Uh, 
Sunyata and Anatta seem to be interconnected. Uh, no, uh, Anatta is also, because Anatta is void of self, and self is the biggest distraction. So, you know, Anatta is also Sunyata, because Anatta is attaining an arahantship, when you fully understand that. And when you overcome the ego, it's, it's tantamount to arahantship. So uh, that's, that's what the, the arahant dwells in when in the fruition attainment of arahantship, he's experiencing that complete anatta, which is voidness too. Uh, so, you know, the differences and similarities, uh, you know, there's, again, there are similarities and there could be some uh, subtle differences like uh, the, the, the arahant who's living still has, uh, you know, the Nibbana with the aggregates. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the Nibbana without the aggregates. So uh, those are, would be different levels of the kind of voidness, but especially the voidness of the anatta is the highest type of uh, voidness. Does voidness require first our deep commitment to studying, practicing the Dhamma? Put forth our best effort in studying the suttas? Uh, no, it's possible. Some people that meditate, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, probably a lot of people who in the beginning they might meditate and because of maybe past life experience, they may, uh, even without meditating, all that much, they could have a brief glimpse of, you know, some kind of one of these levels of voidness, let's say even the first jhana or second jhana, if you would have had experience in a past life, then you might uh, fairly easily be able to uh, reach a level of good concentration or one of those descents into voidness, maybe not the, the very deepest ones, but uh, uh, but you wouldn't be able to get it at will. That's the thing. You know, sometimes people get into these experiences, have glimpses of insight, they have glimpses of, they attain the jhana for maybe a, a minute or two in a long retreat, but when they come back, they can't sustain it. So that's not mastering. So when he says attaining at will, that means to sit down and within two or three minutes, be in a jhana and stay there for hours if you wanted to or stay there in insight contemplation, experiencing, you know, no self. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of that, uh, you know, attaining at will these type of things, not just attaining at once in a blue moon, which the most ordinary meditators might do, but getting them over and over and over and over, and over again. Uh, that's the way that you can, uh, even if it's not the full experience of enlightenment, but just being able to, to get very frequently into those uh, lower types of jhana or insight, uh, insights, you know, the perceptions of impermanence and, and no self, even if they're short, but you get them quite often. Then that is what's going to really help you uh, and uh, be with you, uh, you know, w when you die, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Uh, is Buddha directly or indirectly referred to black holes and outer space? No, I don't think that Buddha would <laughs> refer to black, you know, we got to find a black hole in our mind. That's probably the voidness. You know, voidness will suck up everything. You know, black hole is said to be, everything gets sucked into a black hole. Well, with the insight and voidness, we're sucking all the, the aggregates and we're sucking all the, you know, the mental activity and uh, perceptions into this uh, voidness. So that's the way they should teach black holes, not this stuff about, 
the solar system. What, what use is that going to do you? Nothing. Uh, better not tell Stephen Hawking that, I guess. But I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> okay, friends. Uh, that looks like it's all <laughs> the questions. So I know this is a very, a very deep uh, subject, but it's good to, you know, to, you know, to understand some of these things. So you understand that meditation isn't just about watching your breath, and going ooey wooey and grooving out with a little piti and sukha. You know, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but if you don't pay your attention to it, then people get easily stuck in the same mediocre uh, types of low level meditation uh, without breaking through because, you know, they allow their minds to dither and this and that and uh, get uh, unduly uh, distracted because they, uh, you know, haven't, don't have a lot of studied Dhamma behind you. If, you. if you study the Dhamma, then you'll know. You'll be aware when you're starting to, you know, do a frivolous speech or some other kind of thing. You're going to excite your mind, you know, so you conserve that when you get around groups, not the, oh, I want to go around and hug everybody and get all excited, you know, and so on. Uh, so, okay, friends, uh, we'll go ahead and take a few minutes break now to use the restroom uh, or to get a drink of water and come back and uh, do a few stretches and then have our meditation. Okay, so I'll see you back here in a bit, a few uh, few minutes. So I don't know if I didn't help you because I was cleaning up. I finished. <laughs>
Okay, friends, we'll uh, have our few uh, stretches before we sit to meditate, for those who like. Just find a place where you can kind of move your arms. Oh, let's see. You relax your arms and hands at the sides, relax the shoulders, Just feel the feet pressing the floor. Just try to mentally feel the height and the weight of the body over the feet. Just be aware of standing, standing. Then begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take three or four or five seconds to slowly breathe in, expanding your abdomen, rib cage, and chest. Hold the air in the lungs a few seconds. And feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. Combine all these exercises with that same deep, slow breathing, repeating each exercise three times. So on the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, and arch your lower back a little bit, and stretch upwards at the same time. On the out breath, turn the palms down and touch the top of the head. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, head back. Out breath, touch the head. Third time, hold that upward stretch longer. Release the fingers, the out breath, arms back to the sides. Just relax. Just feel the sensations in your hands and fingers from having stretched the fingers in that way. Just hope that keep your attention in the body rather than getting lost in thought. I just remember standing, standing. Just let your thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Keep the feeling of the body in the front of the awareness. On the next in breath, push up on the toes while raising the arms up in this way over the head to face the hands toward each other, about six inches apart. Out breath, come back down, heels to the floor, hands to the sides. Use the breath to help lift and lower the body in breath. Oh. In. Oh. 
relax. Gently close the eyes, feel the subtle inner sensations. Feel where the clothing touches the skin. All those feeling the physical sensations helps keep the mind from getting lost in its wandering thoughts. In the next in breath, raise both arms over the head. You keep the fingers and arms straight close to your head. On the out breath, bend over your right side as far as you comfortably can. Don't let the arms come apart. Keep them parallel to each other. In breath, lift up. And the left side, out breath. In, again to the right, out breath. In. Once more to each side. In the out breath, lower both arms. <clears throat> Relax, just keep feeling the body. Don't give the mind time to get distracted. Just remember standing, standing. Now we'll do the head turning from right to left. On the in breath, turn your head to the right. So try to look over your right shoulder. Turn the eyes to the right. Try to see some spot behind you. In breath, turn the head 180 degrees back to the left. Concentrate into the neck vertebrae. Turn your eyes to the left. Look at something behind you on the other side. In breath, back to the right. Out breath, left. In breath, right. Left. Next in breath, let the head stop in the center. Just feel the whole body, the feet pressing the floor, the arms and hands at the sides, clothing touching the skin on different places, the head balanced on top.
Okay, friends. <coughs> you ready for our sitting meditation? Again, I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn off uh, my video, so you won't be tempted to want to look up here to see if I'm nodding off or sleeping or something. <clears throat> okay, so just uh, try to sit straight, get comfortable with the seat. Once you place your hands either on your lap or on your legs, try not to move them. Now bring your attention down to feel where the buttocks and feet press the floor underneath. With our gradual descending into voidness, leaving our external house, going into the body, start to feel those sensations of the contact of the buttocks and feet to the floor. And feel your hands and fingers touching. See if you can notice the outline of your thumb and fingers. Feel some sensations in them. Now try to feel or establish the natural inward curve of the lower lumbar vertebrae. It helps support the upper body. And kind of just, just gently kind of arch that lumbar spine in a bit and stretch, lift the back up straight to imagine some space between the spinal vertebrae so the blood and life force can freely circulate through the nervous system then feel the head balanced on top Try to keep the chin level or parallel with the floor. 
you have trouble with the drooping chin. You imagine that you're balancing a stack of books on top of the head. You maintain a straight posture. Otherwise, if you slouch, the books will come crashing down. And just feel that straight posture, alert posture. Feel some sensations on your face, maybe some little prickling sensations. Feel where your lips touch together, where the upper lip touches the lower lip. Feel that dryness or moistness. And feel the tongue laying in the mouth. Feel the teeth of gum. The moistness of the saliva. And then feel the eyes resting in the socket and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. You might see some color or light or just darkness. Relax the eyes. And from that point behind the eyes, kind of just let the awareness Expand a bit to feel the outline of the sitting body. Kind of like the inner silhouette of the sitting body. A sense or feeling of the buttocks and feet underneath the arms and hands at the side. Stomach and chest in the center. And the head balanced on top. Here and now. Then begin some deep, slow breathing to feel the more dynamic, expanding and contracting sensations in the abdomen, rib cage and upper chest. And hold the air in the lungs a few seconds to feel that pause, feel the present moment vibration. And feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. It's cultivating this basic present moment mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. And breathing out, sit here and now, breathing in, letting go of the past and future, and 
breathing out, sitting here and now. In each out breath, sort of feel the mind descending into voidness, Just following the breath down to the end, feel the last bit of air go out, and feeling the next in breath. And uh, perhaps help develop a better concentration. We'll count the breaths from one to 10. Still try to take some slightly deeper breaths to help stay focused, concentrated. And with the next expanding in breath, mentally count one. Holding in the breath a couple of seconds. On the out breath, also count one. Next, expanding in breath, count two. The contracting out breath. Two. The next in breath, three. Out breath, three. In breath, four. Out breath, four. In breath, five. Out breath, fine. In breath, six. Out breath, six. In breath, seven. Out breath, seven. In breath, eight. Out breath eight in breath nine out breath nine in breath Ten out breath ten. Now discontinue the counting, discontinue the deep breathing or any controlled breathing. Just let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled rhythm. Continue to feel it. 
keep the attention focused there in the center of the body to feel the shorter, subtler movements of expanding and contracting. Just knowing when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out. You know it by feeling it. You can use these brief mental notes to help remember just breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, or just in, in, sitting, out, out. Sitting, it's the ongoing continuous present moment of this breathing body. Just with each out breath, feel that descent into voidness that descent into more mental quietude, subtle vibration. Try to notice the beginning, the middle, and the end of the in-breathing and the brief pause. In the beginning, the middle, and the end of the out breathing and the brief pause. And the whole in breath from beginning to end and the pause. The whole out breath from beginning to end and the pause. I feel all those little sensations, the clothing rubbing against the skin, other sensations connected with the breathing. Notice how each breath is different, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it more in the chest, it's always changing.
But at the same time, be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind, to steal your attention away, or any of the five hindrances, drowsiness. Keep remembering, knowing, breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. Just descending into the voidness of everything except sitting and breathing. With each out breath, just descending more and more into the voidness, just sitting and breathing. Whatever sensations are just within the range of the senses, like insect vibration, in the distant background. Coming through that internal voidness, just this body with its senses, life faculty. The subtle vibration. Being aware of the aggregates coming and going, arising and vanishing. Just 
material vibrations, sensations of pleasure or pain. Names or labels or thoughts. Without clinging to them, they just arise and vanish. It's moment by moment. Breath by breath. If you can, just get the sense of this body, six senses, being like an empty house with nobody home. It's void of any owner or resident. Of a me or an I. Let that sense of the me or I just fade away into the background with each out breath, just letting it go, descending more and more into the voidness. The voidness of self.
If more thoughts are coming, or if the mind is getting drowsy, take a few more deep, slow breaths to recharge the body and nervous system up with oxygenated blood and life force to get regrounded, recentered. In the sixth sense nervous system.
Sensations come and go, perceptions and thoughts come and go, the sense of me or I comes and goes. These are just the, the five aggregates of arising and vanishing, coming and going through this space of awareness. It's connected to the nervous system. Even the thought of I or me is just a bubble, mental bubble that arises and vanishes. When you're concentrated, it fades away. When you get more thoughts, it comes back stronger. So what perception arises in the mind from that sound? Sambhi Sankara Anichati Sambhi Sankara Dukkati Sambhi Dhamma Anattati Yadapanyaya 
पास थी अटन बिंद थी दुखी ये समागोविसु All conditioned thing, the five aggregates, the body, mind, and this world are impermanent. All impermanent things, when clung to with ignorance, bring stress and suffering. And all the dhammas, the conditioned dhammas, as well as the unconditioned dhamma. And without any owner or controller, they're void of self. When one sees these three characteristics with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity and freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha. And again, as we normally do, we'll spend the last few minutes sending out thought vibrations of friendliness and kindness of metta, to our own five aggregates and to all other beings. So be kind to your body aggregate. Take some deep, slow breaths. After breathing in, hold the air in the lungs for several seconds. Feel or imagine that oxygenated blood going out to bathe all the cells and tissues of the body with healing, tranquilizing life force. And on the out breath, feel that relaxation of body and mind. That's sending metta to your own body. You're doing deep, slow breathing, something good for it. It's kind of just imagine it, sending metta to your own body and mind, just your deep, slow breathing. Cultivating the thoughts. And may I be well, peaceful, and wise. And I have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. And I'll be able to continue to. Study the Dhamma and practice meditation to descend into voidness from time to time. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. And continue taking a few deep, slow breaths and with. Each out breath, just imagine sending those same kind of thought wishes and vibrations back home to your family, friends, relatives, especially if you know somebody is having particular problems, or sickness. Just imagine on the out breath, those vibrations permeating their body and minds, soothing any sorrows, confusion. Just with each out breath, just continue expanding these vibrations, radiating these meta vibrations across the countryside, to the towns, the cities, across the oceans, and eventually around the whole earth and beyond. 
you can is try to imagine the beautiful blue green earth suspended in space as per the NASA photographs. Just imagine with each out breath, just permeating, saturating, suffusing the whole atmosphere of the earth with these healing vibrations of metta, being pure energy, pure love, pure wisdom. It's with the idea that may all living beings, wherever they might be, be free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance, free from the pain, sorrow, and suffering of body and mind brought about by their unskillful thought, speech, and action. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to hear the teachings of the Dhamma and to practice meditation to help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful and wise. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and Now I invite you to join in chanting the word sadhu three times slowly on the out breath. Breathe in. Sadhu. So Mindfully place your hands at the edge of the knees and on the next in breath, stretch the head back and pull the hands against the knees to arch your lower spine backwards a little bit. Hold it a few moments. Feel all the sensations. And on an in-breath, lift the head up. And on the out-breath, press the chin to the top of the chest. To stretch the neck vertebrae. The in-breath, lift the chin up level on an in-breath. 
out breath, relax the body and mind, put a smile on your face. Okay, friends, so that brings our Wednesday night program uh, to an end. Thank you. And, and I hope that uh, in this next week you can practice that descent into voidness. Each time you meditate, even though you may not reach uh, those deeper levels of voidness, at least that voidness, whether there's just your breathing body with the sensory vibrations coming through and whatever little sounds maybe, you know, in your house, the cat meowing, the crickets, phone ringing in the background, it's, uh, without any reaction, there's nobody at home reacting. That's something to smile about, right? Okay. Some okay, people no. will consider okay. that negative, but... Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. You're welcome. So remember, mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away, a sutta a day keeps illusion away. Thank you, Bhante. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya. Don't forget to remember that, uh, that on September 19th, I'll be giving that uh, a Zoom program of a day of mindfulness. Uh, hope you were able to get that mailing I sent out that have the daily hourly schedule and the link to that uh, program. Oh, no, no, done. <laughs> How are you? What did the doctor tell you? Hmm. Can the doctor keep you at it? Okay, friends, I'm going to sign out now. So, Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, uh,